Hello. Uh, welcome again to our seminar, to our webinar, Democracy and its Current Transformations. Thank you very much for being there again. I'll be very, very quick today with, with uh, the introductions because today we have two presentations. The first is by Maria Martinez Bascuñan. Maria Martinez Bascuñan is a um, professor at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And she's a colleague of mine, and she's an expert in political theory. But she has been, these last years, working as opinion editor at the Spanish newspaper El País. I'll ask her to try to connect her presentation on post-truth, democracy and populism with, with the two lectures uh, we had before on, on the same subject. And I also asked her to try to be as synthetic as, as possible. And then we have um, Tony Sartz. We, we travel um, um, up north to Estonia. He's, um, he's professor for comparative politics in, at the University of Tallinn. And um, his, main, his main interests are in comparative politics, of course, political parties, uh, historical sociology, democratization. And the, the subject is going to deal with is political parties, the quality of democracy, and the rise of populism in, in Central and Eastern Europe. So uh, we'll start with, with Mariam, and then we'll pass over to the second presentation, and then hopefully we'll have time enough for, um, for an interesting discussion. Thank you very much again for being there, and I give the floor to Mariam. Okay, uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here to, to share my thoughts with you about populism and post-truth. Um, I don't have much, much time, so the idea is to add some thoughts on Professor Latorre's presentation of populism. Also, uh, regarding Professor Vallespin's reflections on post-truth, and the public sphere, but more focus on a dimension that it is more familiar for me, how populism has affected traditional media and journalism. So um, my main thesis is that even if populism is receding, it has left an epistemological crisis and a crisis in the role of journalism that is still alive. Um, the epistemological crisis has to do with the breakdown of the consensus regarding the objectivity of facts. It's the poison gift of populism, which I fear that will last. For instance, uh, Trump loses, but his voters believe that he has won. So regarding populism, I would like uh, to focus on two questions and answers. First, uh, how to define populism? What is the populist agenda? And what misconceptions prevail in understanding populism? And two, is populism becoming the new normal in Western democracies? Um, regarding how populism has affected journalism and traditional media, I'm going to put some questions too. One, how neutral and objective can journalism be when attacks on the democratic system also attack its own foundations? And two, how do you manage to overcome the populist framing and define your own terms and subjects? So let's start by the beginning. How to define populism? Well, um, when it comes to populism, it has become a sort of cliche to begin by stating that it is very difficult to define it, that it's an elusive concept in spite of our using it constantly. Hence, uh, one of the biggest problems in trying to understand it, it's indiscriminate use in our public space. Any show of flattery towards the people is immediately characterized as populist, but the adjective is used as a weapon for the political disqualification of leaders and parties. It is therefore an insulting and offensive term. All of this makes it hard to define and dissect. However, 
if, if I have to choose a basic idea as a starting point to understand it and especially to use it in empirical studies, I would say that populism is not an ideology, but rather a logic of political action. If ideology had a central role, it wouldn't make sense to differentiate between left-wing populism and right-wing populism. What sets left-wing populism apart from right-wing populism is what each of them sees as their political opponent. Whereas left-wing populism often designates the elites as opposed to the good people, the people as an homogeneous entity that suffers all the current negativity, right-wing populism tends to point at the other social groups such as immigrants. In this case, the people is the genuine part of it, infected by outsiders who may be immigrants or the elites or both. So more than the doctrine, what matters is their emotional rhetoric, always full of a heavy emotional content, the way of achieving hegemony, the creation of stereotypes and framings that help to build an us against them. So this is the essential part of this logical operation, because if a totalizing political subject is to exist, it is necessary to look for an antagonist. That is why populism is always enunciated through simplification and polarization, both in the definition of people and the definition of their so-called enemy, us versus them, people versus elites, insiders versus outsiders, those at the top versus those at the bottom. And this distinction attaches higher moral value to the party supposedly injured while blaming the offender. For this reason, the definition provided by Jan Werner Muller is, is interesting. He says, we don't have anything like, like a theory of populism. Populism is a particular moralizing conception of politics based on polarization. In turn, this polarization is based on three simplification. First, a sociological and political simplification. Two, an institutional simplification. And three, the simplification of the meaning of the social cohesion. Regarding the first one, a sociological and political simplification, that means that the people is an obvious subject sorry, an obvious subject defined by its difference from the elites. It is the healthy and unified part of society. This simplification derives from a fallacy because the existence of a rich elite doesn't give to the people the consideration of a united mass. Two, a institutional simplification because it sees the representative system as alienating the people and being structurally corrupted by politicians. The paradox is that at the same time that they reject the representation dimension of democracy, the populists claim to be the sole true representatives of the people. And we see that in leaders such as Orban, Farage, Putin or, or Trump. So this simplification derives from a fallacy to the only real form of democracy is the one that calls directly to the people. That is to say, the referendum. But the opposite of representation is not participation, but rather the absence of representation. The representation dimension of democracy complements the participation and the deliberation ones. In democracy, all three dimensions go hand in hand. And third, the simplification of the meaning of the social cohesion, built based on identity rather than on the preservation and the distribution of resources. There is an appeal to identity in order to draw societies together. And that is a mistake. What really creates cohesiveness is social justice, solidarity, economic protection and distribution. So regarding the populist agenda, I will say that 
to the extent that populists are not characterized by their contents in terms of, of doctrine, we cannot define their agenda on specific policies. They don't have them. I will call them as infectious parties because their discourses end up provoking an ideological reconfiguration within the traditional political forces so that, especially in the case of conservative parties, they come to embrace populist strategies. In the case of Europe, their agenda is clear, to destroy European democratic principles and values in the name of a return to national identities and values instead of universalism. As for the prevailing misconceptions, I would say that the first one is thinking that populism is an ideology. It is a form of political action that turns conflict into the basic definition of the political. Two, it is uh, another misunderstanding is thinking that populism is engaged with people's real problems. Therefore, I think that rather than asking the right questions, populists have been able to capture the move we need to look at reality in a different way. For instance, in the Yellow Vest movement, not only do they claim to be part of an exploited class, by, but they see themselves as invisible. That is why emotions are as important as economic facts to explain the movement. We need indicators of dignity and anger. This feeling that one's life doesn't count for anything or it is not important, that one is invisible, is set, it's set against a context of fear. And fear in turn feeds another emotions such as rage, guilt and envy. Fear blocks rational deliberation, poisons hope and prevents constructive cooperation for a better future. Many people feel powerless and unable to control their lives. They fear for their future. Such perceptions are based on real problems, estimating lower middle class incomes and higher costs of education when a degree is more and more necessary to find a work. This feeling of fear easily leads to the blaming of different groups such as immigrants, ethnic minorities or women. They have taking away our jobs is a common expression of the collective imagination. Also, if we prevent them from coming in and women from thriving, we will be able to get our pride back and in the case of men, our virility. So that is how another emotion emerges that erodes democracy, envy. And another misunderstanding about populism is thinking that populists are not part of the political class. They are. Another one is thinking that they are the true patriots, even when they are the ones doing, doing the most damage to the future of nations. But is populism becoming the new normal in Western democracies? Well, uh, it doesn't seem that they are going to go away anytime soon. So we will have to learn to live with, with them. But I think we cannot treat them as normal parties because they want to destroy democracy. Their agenda is to influence the conservative party's platforms. In the face of this strategy, I think we have seen two approaches. The Austrian one, where Kurz decided to integrate them into his government rather than reach an agreement with democratic forces, and Merkel, who has suffered the consequences of having, having a great coalition, but has resisted much better than Austria against the extreme right effort to infect her government's agenda. The key for democratic forces is the coming years will be based on the dialectics between cooperation and contracts. 
the threat from populist parties will compel the democratic forces to reinforce their cooperation in order to protect the institutions. But on the other hand, those democratic forces must not allow that the conflict solely dividing line be the one set by populism. Consequently, they will have to cooperate while presenting different options among them. At the same, um, I think the same applies to Europe. Pro-European forces must reinforce their cooperation, move the European project ahead, and at the same time prevent the only dividing line from being that between pro-Europeans and Europhobes. And for doing so, it is very important to have a public sphere with a strong role of traditional media and journalism. But how neutral and objective can journalism be when attacks on the democratic system also attack its own foundations. I think um, this question goes beyond journalism. It is about democracy itself. Can we be tolerant with intolerance? Well, in her book, Kill All Normies, Angela Nagel explains how the old right movement made, made it into the mainstream media and was able to occupy the centrality of political debate. They achieved it mainly because their scandalous positions were considered informative on part of those media. Thus, a movement that came from the margins of internet was able to gain a hegemonic position in public debate. The media themselves gave them that opportunity and backing. But populism is about provocations. So my next question is, what provocations do journalists have to deal with and what can and may they ignore? I think uh, there is not a general rule on that. I will say that it is important that journalism doesn't look at itself as if it were a kind of political party. I'm referring to what happened in the United States and on the role of journalism regarding the behavior of Donald Trump. I think newspapers will not transform themselves in something similar to an opposition party. They should have the commitment of being critical with power, but they don't have the role of being something akin to a political party, the opposition party. In democracy, each actor plays its own role, and the one that journalism has to play is a very important one regarding the control of the president, but without assuming the role that corresponds properly to a political party. And I would like to finish with a reflection about the role that noise has in the current, current public debate. I think uh, debate, but sorry. Journalism and traditional media is about building hierarchical voices, but for doing so, it has to recover the trust, this intangible value that it might have lost in the last years. And for doing so, they have to give an adequate account of the times, the social emotional move, the sounds of the new movements, just as social media do. But, and this is crucial, always maintaining a dialogue with the humanities. If journalism breaks up with this dialogue with the humanities, it will, it, it will be dead or irrelevant. And I think I, I'm going to stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Marianne. <clears throat> There are quite a lot of issues that we can discuss later on regarding your presentation. And now I give the floor to Tunis. So, hello, I am Tunis uh, from Tallinn University. And actually, we are moving now to, the, to Eastern Europe and uh, further to the north as well. 
And uh, actually, I'm going to talk about populism, yes, but I'm also going to talk about political parties because political parties seems to be very important actors concerning the rise of populism and uh, democratic backsliding. So my presentation will be about uh, parties, democratic backsliding in Central Eastern Europe, and about populism uh, as well, of course. What is the major message? The major message I want to deliver is that if you're looking at Central Eastern Europe, then actually this region is more, 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 more diverse than you might expect. Uh, not all countries in uh, that region look like uh, as Poland and Hungary, so there's a great, great diversity and also concerning parties, party systems, and populism and democratic backsliding. Perhaps it would be surprising for you. And the second major message is that the two party systems lead to help. In other words, they might contribute to the democratic backsliding to a large extent. Uh, at least in Central Eastern Europe. Not so much in Western Europe and in Southern Europe, but in Eastern Europe, it seems to be that, that type of party system, the two party systems or the systems which are close to that uh, might contribute to the democratic backsliding. And I'm going to explain it even more, how it's, it works. First, about uh, the quality of democracy in Central Eastern Europe, uh, according to the Freedom House. If you are looking at if you are looking at Freedom House scores uh, from 2010, then that was the picture. So Central Eastern Europe was mostly populated at that time in 2010, 10 years ago was mostly populated by consolidated democracies or by semi-consolidated democracies. So this picture was very, very good and encouraging. This is the situation now. And as you can see, there has been a quite considerable democratic backsliding. For example, in Hungary, which is nowadays considered as a uh, hybrid regime, in Poland, which is considered as a uh, consolidated, consolidating democracy, not anymore consolidated democracy. Uh, but still, we have some uh, consolidated democracies, uh, liberal democracies in the Baltic states. Uh, we have the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and so on. So the picture is not so so bad, but still there have been uh, a tremendous change uh, concerning the quality of democracy in Central Eastern Europe. And of course, the mo most notorious notorious cases are Poland and Hungary, as you can see, especially. Hunger. But now the major problem is how to explain it. What was happening? Why it was happening to the Eastern European countries? And there could be four major possible explanations. First, of course, the economic explanation, and here inequality is the major issue. The cultural backlash thesis, uh, here the major focus is on values, on value orientations, uh, and perhaps Eastern Europeans are revolting against the so-called assault 
by the liberal and post-material values. And there is also post-colonial colonial explanation. So there is uh, the end of age, age of emulation and uh, failure of neoliberal Europeanization project uh, in the East. And there is also the fourth possible explanation, and this would be my favorite one. This is the party system or the party centered explanation. I'm going to introduce all these four, but I concentrate more on, on, on the last. First, economic reasons. Yes, it's quite obvious and quite well known that the inequality, of course, it's higher than uh, in, in Central East Europe, it's higher than in Western Europe. And uh, nowadays, the losers of the post-communist transition uh, have also become the losers of globalization. And to, those losers are very angry, especially the working class and the rural population in Eastern and Central Europe. And thus, they vote for the populist parties because they are angry, they are deprivated somehow feel deprivated somehow. And uh, by the way, if you're looking at uh, the populist parties in Central Eastern Europe, then we can see that those populist parties, the most notorious, notorious ones, uh, by, uh, by S uh, in, in Poland, Kaczynski's party, and, and, in, and Fidesz party in Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban's party, they are actually putting quite a lot of emphasis on the welfare state, on uh, reducing the reducing economic insecurity, and so on. So it's it seems to be a, a bit astonishing that actually these populist parties are nowadays in Central East Europe. They are nowadays one of the major promoters of social equality and the welfare state. And, and uh, of course, it's, it's quite obvious that people are supporting those parties. If they are providing quite uh, generous uh, child benefits, like uh, the Polish Populist Party does, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, what is quite um, uh, unexpected is that there is no left-wing populism in Central East Europe. And why? If you're looking at the history of the region, it's quite obvious. There is a stigma associated with the left-wing ideologies. Because in Central East Europe, we had a real socialism. And um, so nowadays it's, yes, quite paradoxical that especially those new populist parties are giving the voice to the working class, giving the voice to the oppressed uh, population, uh, giving the voice to the poor, at least to some extent, because those parties are really concerned about social inequality in those countries. The mainstream parties were not so concerned about this. But yes, this explanation, this ex economic explanation seems to be quite valid. But if you are looking at, at the data, and if you are looking at, uh, at, uh, at the data uh, in a very critical way, uh, this is uh, the Gini index, uh, one of the major me uh, measures of inequality it's widely used, so you can see that actually in Hungary and in Poland, social inequality, the level of social inequality is comparable with the Scandinavian countries, Sweden and Denmark. And for example, in Lithuania and Bulgaria and Latvia, there are no democratic backsliding. 
So this social inequality argument or the economic argument is, is, is not feasible. It's, it's not, not working. But um, what about uh, the second approach? Uh, what about the values? Here is a famous book by um, very well-known authors um, by Pippa Norris and uh, Ronald Ingerhardt, Culture of Backlash. And uh, they actually support uh, the cultural, cultural explanation uh, to the rise of uh, populism. And um, we probably all of you know this uh, Ronald Hingerhart's uh, The Silent Revolution thesis. And um, in essence, uh, the message is that the liberal and self expression values, uh, tolerance towards minorities, multiculturalism, all those, those values are on the rise. And thus, the older generation and the older generation also in, in the Eastern Europe, they, they don't like those values. They are revolting now uh, and, and somehow feel threatened. And maybe that might be the explanation why we can see this democratic backlash and, and uh, the rise of populism uh, in, in the East. And here is um, Mm, uh, one survey by, uh, by uh, the Eurobarometer, and it's about uh, the tolerance uh, towards uh, homosexuality. And as, as you can see, uh, the Berlin Wall is still standing. If you are looking at tolerance towards homosexuality in Eastern Europe, it's, it, it's, it's very, very weak. It's almost absent. So in Central Eastern Europe, there are, there are living very conservative people. So concerning the values, it's, it seems to be, to be quite valid the explanation because Central Eastern Europeans are indeed much more conservative, uh, supporting uh, traditional values, and so on. Uh, and, and they somehow feel, uh, feel that uh, the liberal self-expression values, uh, which are imposed by, by the Western Europeans uh, on, on them, uh, they feel that these values are not indigenous for Central and Eastern Europe. And, and so they feel threatened. But at the same time, consider the Lithuanian case. Lithuania just had uh, the elections uh, last year and uh, the populist radical right actually failed to get any seats in the parliament. And think about the neighboring Poland and think about the history. These countries are actually quite, quite similar to each other. Uh, they are also Catholic and, and quite traditional, but still in, in Lithuania, this, 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 the cultural backlash thesis was, was not, not working. So there might be a, a problem uh, related to this thesis as well. But what about this anti colonial explanation. So it's a very good book. I really recommend you to, to read it if you're interested in Central Eastern Europe. A very good book by Ivan Krastev and uh, Stefan Holmes. Uh, and actually, they say or argue that, that the copycat mentality the Eastern Europeans have adopted uh, for so long, for so so far, uh, it, it's not making anyone happy. Uh, you still remain an inferior copy 
of an original. So actually, maybe the explanation would be that the Eastern Europeans are just tired of being inferior as poor copies of the West. And now they are, they have their own dignity and now they are asserting it. And uh, overall, there is a, uh, the end of age of emulation. This Western model, most Western model, uh, Western liberal model is, is not so, uh, so tempting anymore like it was. Uh, and not so popular anymore like it was about 20 years ago. We have to take into account this as well. And um, if we consider this possible colonial approach, so-called colonial approach, uh, then put yourself, yourself in, in the shoes of, uh, of an Eastern European. First, in, in 1989, there was a Request, request to introduce uh, the democratic norms and the free market. Then in 2000, there was a request to adopt uh, the, the a key communitaire, I mean, in order to join uh, the EU. There were several requirements. Then at post-accession uh, accession period, the Eastern Europeans had to promote gender equality and LGTB rights. Then in 2015, they had to be tolerant towards uh, immigrants and adopt uh, multiculturalists and so on and so on. If you're looking at this picture and uh, putting yourself in, uh, in the shoes of, uh, of uh, uh, an Eastern European, Maybe you can understand why there is a, such a revolt in Central Eastern Europe. But however, as I mentioned before, all those um, explanations somehow uh, uh, fall short in explaining this phenomenon, uh, the democratic backsliding and the rise of populism in Central Eastern Europe. So, if uh, if this um, cultural backsliding uh, thesis is, is 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 working, or the post-colonial thesis is is working, uh, then why we cannot see an universal democratic backsliding in all the countries in Central East Europe? Why we can see it only in in Hungary and in Poland? but not in Slovenia or in, in the Baltic states. And uh, so I think that probably one of the most relevant explanation here uh, would be rather the party centered or the party system centered explanation. Um, if you are considering democratic backsliding in Central Eastern Europe, and if you are looking at, at the cases of Poland and Hungary in particular, then, uh, and comparing them with, with, with other cases, with other countries in Central Eastern Europe, then we can see actually a very distinct uh, peculiar, peculiar pattern. First, in Hungary and Poland, there are one party dominated governments in both countries. Even if Poland starts a coalition government, but still one party is dominant in the, in the executive. In all other countries in Central East Europe, Eastern Europe, there are coalition governments, multiple parties in the government. So Poland and, and Hungary are big exceptions in Hungary and Poland, even in the 2000s, one could see a tendency in which two countries were moving towards the two-party system, or two-party systems, or to a system which was quite similar 
to the two party system, two and half party system. Uh, I mean, uh, Spanish people know what it means because you have had uh, two and half party system for for a very long time, two dominant parties. But in Poland and Hungary, you could see the same thing already in the two thousands, and uh, in in Hungary. There was Fidesz versus Socialist Party. In Poland, there was PIS uh, uh, versus Citizen Platform. Citizen Platform is a liberal party. PIS is conservative party. Um, and, and this pattern was already visible there in, in the 2000s. So, but in all other countries, in Central Eastern Europe. There are quite fragmented party systems. Uh, many parties, multi-party systems. So again, Hungary and Poland seems to be big exceptions in the region, because otherwise there are multi-party systems. And many are, of them are quite uh, under-institutionalized, uh, quite unstable, very fragmented, and so on. So it seems to be that there is something to do with the parties as very important actors uh, in uh, democratic uh, governance uh, and party systems. And uh, it seems to be that if you have a fragmented and less consolidated party system, it's rather a good thing because then the populist parties have to cooperate with the mainstream, mainstream parties in order to form uh, a coalition government. Uh, coalition governments themselves are very efficient uh, instruments in taming the populist actors. As we know, we have many examples here uh, from Austria and Finland and so on. Uh, no party gets uh, a majority. It's also a good thing because in Hungary and Poland it did happen that one party was able to get a majority in a parliament. And you have multiple and uh, cross-cutting cleavages in a society. Not only one major cleavage, as in Hungary and in Poland. In Hungary and Poland, the major cleavage is nationalist forces nationalist populist forces versus uh, cosmopolitan and the left-wing uh, parties or forces. So in all the other countries, you can see rather uh, multiple cleavages. And uh, by the end of the uh, presentation, um, Actually, we can uh, outline the major mechanism which seems to be behind the democratic backsliding in Central East Europe, particularly Hungary and Poland. So first, you have this unidimensional uh, cleavage structure and mounting polarization, as it happened in Poland and Hungary already in, due to, uh, in the 2000s. Then you have uh, the concentration of the party competition and the center parties or the center is, is, is uh, it, it weakens. Uh, then polarization deepens. Uh, uh, your opponents become as enemies. You have going to have a toxic polarization instead just the polarization. You are going to have a toxic polarization. It happened in Hungary already in the 2000s. Then one illiberal party seizes the power and becomes dominant in, in the government and in the parliament. It happened in Hungary also in 2010, in Poland a bit later in 2015, but the mechanism was the same. And if this uh, illiberal party is already in power, then it's a democratic backsliding. And the major problem here 
is that actually their voters are willing to forgive to uh, democratic violations or violations against uh, democracy because they think that the alternative would be much worse. And so in, in that way, polarization is, is, is playing a very uh, negative role uh, in, in the rise of, of populism. But if you're looking at all the other countries in Central East Europe, then we actually can see that this, this mechanism was not working. It was working only in Hungary and Poland, which had a very polarized party system and, and two major parties. In, in Estonia and Slovenia and Romania, yes, populists have been in government, but actually they have not had any substantial impact on, on, on those countries. There is no democratic backsliding in, in Estonia, in Slovenia and Romania. Uh, in Slovakia, in Slovakia, the populist right parties have been in government for several times, but they have been always the members of the coalition parties and no democratic backsliding either. And about the Baltic states, uh, I know more about them. Why not democratic backsliding? Because we have this fragmented multi-party systems. And this seems to be one of the major uh, factors which is playing role here. Of course, Russia and, and uh, the security concerns as well, but this party system factor seems to be essential. So to put it very short, the two party system is a road to hell at least in Central and Eastern Europe. It seems to be in that way. So to conclude it, as you can see, there is a great diversity in Central Eastern Europe. Not all the countries are the same as Poland and Hungary. Actually, those two countries are rather big exceptions. I'm trying to explain it. And it seems to be that, yes, we have many explanations to the rise of populism and democratic backsliding in Central Eastern Europe. But it seems to be that parties and party systems are playing a very important role here. How parties are behaving, what is the type of the party system. And the two party system represent a road to hell. Multi-party systems work much better and seems to be the best guarantee against democratic backsliding, at least in Central Eastern Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. <clears throat> Thank you very much, very much to, to both of you. I was thinking that um, two-party systems are the road to hell. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds like, like a song by ACDC. I mean, they <laughs> something like that, but I think it's, it's a good motive. Okay, um, we have some questions already, but I'd like to, as the two subjects are, don't um, mix well, perhaps we should start with, with Mariam again. And, and I, have a, I would have a couple of questions. Um, um, there's, always, there's always the problem regarding populism as to how to, how to address it. So what, we know that the causes that trigger it um, have to do more perhaps in Western Europe than in Eastern Europe, as we have seen, have to do with, um, with the new economic problems, with the, the decline of the middle classes. And so, um, do you think, Mariam, do you think that the, uh, we need more public spending, um, a more social Europe? Um, how can we include citizens' concerns in, in future trade deals? Do you think uh, this can be solved by sheer economic means? We know that we know that uh, Tony's thesis is not. <laughs> the answer is no, right? <clears throat> but do you think that that uh, could be a solution for um, Western Europe? 
Yes, um, thank you so much for, for the question. Bien, um, uh, I think that while the principle of ca causality is not yet clear, uh, many economists such as Blan Blanco Milanovic, uh, Danny Rodrik, or even Thomas Piketty have remarked on the importance of economic factors to explain the rise of populism in our times. If, as Marx said, the material basis conditions the way of seeing the world, it is here that we must try to, to find the, the explanation for, for what is happening, I, I think. Um, the abandoning of the interwar social contract is at the root of the political conflicts that have provoked Brexit and the rise of the new lines of conflict, the gap between uh, countryside and city, the generational gap, the gap between winners and losers from globalization, and, and the big geopolitical divide between the West and, and Asia. Uh, I think it is important to, to do not forget that Milanovic has provided uh, empirical support to the idea that we have lived in the most unequal age in history, that inequality has been growing since the 80s and, and has affected especially the middle class. Uh, um, but that uh, at the global level, Western lower and middle classes has suffered the effect of reduced social protection, while the new middle classes in China and, and India have seen their incomes increase since 1998. Uh, I think this explains, of course, the success of Trump's protectionism and the political turbulence we, fa we, we are experiencing in, in, in Europe. Um, but I think the bad governance of globalization explains the rise of populism too. That is what, is, what study, studies like populism and the economics of globalization by, by, by Danny Rodrik show. Um, for instance, he, he establishes a correlation between the current, the current outbreak of populism and economic globalization that may be the main variable. So I think we must be uh, uh, optimistic. Uh, I think uh, changing, changing Europe is possible. I think uh, also that there are very interesting initiatives in that sense. Uh, I am thinking about the manifesto written by Thomas Piketty uh, two years ago, I think, where uh, he presents specific proposals to involve citizens in the European project and redirect it to a deeper integration. I think in, uh, in, in this manifesto, for instance, he proposes a democratization treaty and a democratization budget with clauses to avoid the rule of fiscal unanimity and the creation of a sovereign European assembly made up of both members of national parliaments and members of the European Parliament. And I think uh, it is a, a, a good proposal. But at the end, it is necessary to implement policies that become a meeting point of the working classes and the middle classes that today, and even in this context, more important in this context, in this pandemic context, that today are distancing themselves from Europe and are threatening to destroy it. Thank you. <clears throat> but you know, one... one one would think that um, if the economy is the problem, if inequality is the problem, one would vote for um, leftist parties. So why <coughs> switch um, populist parties? Why to vote for populist parties instead of voting for leftist parties? So, uh, Tunis, uh, could you join, jo join us now and, um, and tell us something about uh, 
why you discard so easily the, the economic factor while talking about populism? I'm actually not discarding it. Um, to some extent, it, it's valid, of course. But especially if you're looking at the Poland and Hungary, then it seems to be that this economic factor is not the most potent one. Of course, in both countries, you can see uh, inequality. It's, it's uh, as I tried to show you, this, the level of inequality is, is even comparable with, uh, with uh, Sweden and, and Denmark uh, in, in Poland and, and Hungary. And um, it seems to be that this inequality, even if it contributes, at least to some extent, to the rise of populism and uh, to the democratic backsliding in Hungary and Poland, it's, it's not the major factor. But of course, I'm not going to rule it out. It's, it's valid. And especially it's valid in, in that context that, as I mentioned, uh, in Hungary and, and Poland, two populist parties are nowadays the major parties which are addressing social inequality. They are the major promoters of the welfare reforms and so on. So it matters. Uh, and uh, and uh, they are actually doing uh, good work on this. And this is the major reason why uh, the people are supporting two parties. Be because two parties are providing this the social welfare, at least to some extent. Uh, mainstream parties in the 2000s, I mean, liberal parties, especially neoliberal parties, uh, fail to do this, to promote, to promote welfare state. And in that respect, the Eastern uh, Central Europe is, is different uh, uh, from the West. Yeah, um, before um, picking up some of the, of the questions that we have already received, um, I missed something in your, in, in your presentation because um, from our perspective, the main problems regarding <clears throat> Eastern European states is their, um, their rather um, recent access to full sovereignty, right? So mm -hmm. they, they, most of them belong to former um, empires, so Habsburgen or uh, Ottoman or um, the Russian Empire, right? So and then, then when they finally achieve uh, independence, they're subject to a certain rule on part of the European Union, right? So this, um, I don't know how to describe it, maybe this, this frustration of not being capable of really um, enjoying the full sovereignty is something that, that makes sense in, in a certain sense, right? So uh, why not? Then on the other hand, um, I think uh, some of those countries, I think it was Krasnev himself who, who wrote about this. Well, the amazing thing is that uh, nowadays we have a national populist party, so PIS, uh, uh, ruling Poland, that has a, a totally nationalistic uh, discourse at a time when Poland, for the first time, is mainly inhabited by only Poles. Right, so it doesn't make sense. So it, it's um, there's such a such a mix. Well, you said it before. You know, um, you know, Eastern Europe is is complex. So we don't have we don't have uh, just one 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 rule through which to um, to analyze it. But um, you know, this kind of contradictions I feel fascinating, right? Because um, you can never really pick one single one single vector, one one single variable. You know, as defining, so what's what's going on, and what's I mean, what's what's the cause in the end of of populism? So what? So we know yours is the political uh, party system, that's your main hermeneutic uh, instrument, so to say. But don't you think these other elements are also are are also important? Yes, they are important, of course. And uh, when I was talking about. The, the post-colonial perspective, I mean, uh, 
the influence uh, by the EU and, and by the West and, and, and so on. Of course, it's, it's relevant. It's, it's playing a, a very important role in, in explaining uh, the democratic backlash, at least to some extent, in some countries. But uh, only in some countries. Because if you take the Baltic countries, there is no democratic backlash. Uh, and, and the Baltic countries are uh, one of the most uh, pro-EU countries uh, in Europe right now, if we are looking at uh, public opinion surveys. They are the most pro-EU. So we can see a great diversity here. And, and um, I don't rule out all of those other explanations, the economic explanation, uh, the post-colonial uh, explanation and, and also the cultural backlash. But it seems to be that, as I try to tell you, one of the major factors seems to be what makes this distinction between Poland and Hungary on, on the one hand and all the other countries, all the other Central Eastern European countries on the other. It seems to be that Two countries, Poland and Hungary, have a very peculiar party system. And for me, parties and party systems, they, they can explain this, this democratic backsliding, at least to some extent, in those countries, if you follow this mechanism I try to, to describe. But I don't rule all, uh, out all, all these other indicators or variables or uh, explanations uh, either. So it's a very complex picture. Yeah. So some of the, um, <clears throat> I'll let you know some of the, of the questions. Um, Alba Requejo, um, um, how would you suggest a Central and Eastern European countries shift their approach to a proactive one instead of a copycat? In the European Union, they don't have the same power. I consider it is a, a dynamics that is not easy to change. Um, I think she's referring to the copycat uh, uh, argument, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> do you think that, that it can be switched to, um, to another one, apart from the populistic, of course? Yes, uh, to some extent, if you're looking at uh, Central Eastern Europe and, and their relationship with the EU. So nowadays, of course, Central Eastern European uh, countries have become more proactive and, and more active in the EU as well, especially Poland, by the way. Even if they are publicly, I mean, in, in, the, in the domestic uh, politics uh, they are rather skeptical towards the EU in, in Poland. Uh, then, uh, in reality, Poland uh, is playing quite important role in, in, in the EU and in formulating the EU's uh, policies and so on. It's one of the key members right now, actually. It's one of the largest. Also in, it's it's population. one of the largest and very active as well, and very proactive as well. So, there is some kind of a paradox. You are against the EU, EU at home, but at the same time, in Brussels, you are quite, let's say, rational. Okay, here we have another question for you, um, Professor Sart. So the problem of um, bipartisanism is the result rather than the cause. The holistic approach is more persuasive. What is important is the processes that are happening in the development of the sovereign the sovereign of the sovereignty of the people i guess he wants to say economic cultural um, processes create toxic polarization and the party's position as a result of democratic election is the result um, of pre-social processes electoral law is similar everywhere in the eu i i i haven't understood it it, it um, it's in detail, but what he means to say, I guess, is that that the um, the party structure somehow reflects the problems within a certain 
a certain country. So, um, so it's not that the the party system conditions um, conditions whether there will be or not um, populistic um, exits. But you know what you know. But you know the the underlying motives you, that that. Uh, so to say that in gender, I mean that in, in gender, or that are that push forward the existence of those movements, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so the the party system is a product of underlying causes that could be economic, could be cultural, as you said before as well. Um, instead of fixing on on the party system, so do you think um, do you think this um, this is a point? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a very good point. And actually, what we can see in Poland and Hungary, and I was also referring to that in my presentation, the major problem seems to be that um, if you're looking at cleavages, social cleavages on, uh, in, in those countries, as we know, social cleavages uh, are supposed to reflect the major conflicts in a society. So in two, two countries, at least uh, since the 2000s, there has been one of the major, one major overarching cleavage in which you have uh, more nationalistic uh, uh, more, let's say, clerical, pro-religion uh, parties on the one hand, which are also usually the right-wing parties, and then uh, uh, rather more cosmopolitan, uh, urban-based, uh, and anti-clerical parties on the other. And that kind of comp compound cleavage nationalists versus cosmopolitans, was uh, already emerging in uh, Poland and Hungary in the 2000s. At that time, there was no two-party system, at least uh, in, in, in Poland. It was already emerging in, in Hungary. But it seems to be, of course, this, this structure of cleavages, it has the social roots. And there is something to do with the history of those countries, the social structure, and so on. So through the cleavages, of course, uh, uh, those party systems have formed uh, because uh, those peculiar cleavage constellations. And those cleavage constellations are having the roots in the society. Yeah. Okay, now now a question for um, for Mariam, and and I think this has to do with what I was talking about the other day. So um, the problem is how um, how do we organize diversity of opinion in a civilized way? Hmm? Because um, so somehow um, journalism has been contaminated by this economy of attention, right? So that um, <clears throat> in this sense. So um, uh, the crossing of boundaries, so the scandalization, seems to be an incentive for uh, journalism to enter into uh, into this, um, you know, into this into this populist discourse. Do you think? Um, do you think we can we can go back to a more, if there ever was, by the way, to a more, um, let's say, to a more um, civil civil argumentation within? Or in civil opinion, opinion debates, uh, and in, in journalism. Yes, thank you for for the question. Um, how to organize uh, the, the the debate? Well, um, I will say uh, with empathy. Uh, I would say that it is important to approach in their concerns of, of, of people. Uh, I think it is important to understand their ways of thinking or see things 
and by offering them the chance of gaining new and alternative approaches to their worries and, and, and expectations. But I think um, um, demonization doesn't work. In those cases, it provokes the opposite reaction and confirms the line that populism wants to draw. The, the problem is that populism always targets the media, accusing them of constant lying. I don't know how to, to, to this can be solved, how to fight back, but this is one of our main challenges. I, I, I was surprised the electoral nine when Trump won the elections uh, about a tweet written by Paul Krugman. Uh, that night, he said, neither I nor the people that read the New York Times have understood anything about the place we live. So I think this cannot happen anymore. Uh, so the question is, is that how to, to organize diversity of opinion and to, to do this, to, to do this uh, public uh, debate more inclusive. Um, I think uh, it is important to pointing out and making its boundaries. You cannot organize a political debate and invite Bannon to participate in it, in it for instance. That is a way to, to normalize populism. Uh, I think you, you can interview him, of course, but you cannot treat him as if he were another normal politician or intellectual. Uh, you cannot give a democratic treatment to someone who wants to undermine democracy. But th there is certainly a temptation to, to do it in our difficult of highly competitive market of, of attention, he's a plus. Uh, so I think it's difficult not to, to yield to, to it, so we certainly sue. So it is a difficult question, yes. Okay, then I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Tunis. Uh, what about you know, media, and, media and populism or the change of the public sphere and, and uh, you know, the role they might be playing in fostering populism? I, I guess it's uh, quite the same in Central Eastern Europe as in, in Western Europe. Of course, there is one difference um, in very many Central Eastern European countries, and especially in Poland and Hungary, to less extent uh, in Slovakia and, and Czech Republic, um, there has been uh, a concentration of uh, public uh, media channels in the hands of uh, of the power parties. So the power parties, uh, are, the parties in, in power, are actually to some extent controlling uh, the public media, at least in Poland and Hungary, and in uh, the Czech Republic, uh, there are some quite uh, influential oligarchs who are controlling the media and so on. But at the same time, again, in Slovenia, in Estonia, in, in Latvia and, and Lithuania, media is, is not controlled by the government or, or by some powerful oligarchs. Okay, what's the, and, and what's the case of your, of your own country in, in, in Estonia? In, in Estonia, um, let's say uh, there is an index of um, media freedom. And uh, media freedom uh, or the freedom of press in Estonia is one of, uh, uh, the score is one of the highest in, in Europe. Yeah. So no problem. Okay, very good. You know, because you know, one of the one of the first things that any any populist government does, of course, that's not the case of Estonia. You know, I was thinking about mm -hmm. Hungary. You know, it's trying to control the media. So that's uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Javier, would you would you like to pose um, one of the questions? Hello. 
Um, I would like to pose, uh, well, a couple of questions, one's for Tonis and, and the other one for Mariam. Uh, so the first one is, is for Tonis. Uh, so you mentioned that a multi-party system with, with a moderate level of fragmentation prevents, uh, uh, well, against democratic backlash due to populism. Uh, but can we forward this 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 hypothesis, this answer outside of, of, of Central and Eastern Europe? Because cases like like Italy uh, seems to act uh, counter to, to that point. Uh, it, it is it, it was a, it was a, a multi party system with a moderate level of, of fragmentation before the entrance of populist forces. So is Italy an exception uh, to your uh, findings? Or, or, or would you say that this explanation only works for, for central? It, it, yes. That's, that's yes, a very good question. Um, it seems to be that it, this, this thesis I tried to uh, pose is more valid for new democracies, less valid for old consolidated democracies. And concerning uh, the new democracies, I guess this thesis about the multi-party system versus uh, the dual-party system, this, this thesis seems to be even valid for uh, Central, uh, for uh, Latin America, at least to some extent. If you're looking at the cases of democ democratic backsliding in, in Latin America, then I guess that the dual-party systems highly polarized two-party systems are much more uh, vulnerable, vulnerable uh, to the democratic spec sliding uh, than uh, multi-party systems in, in Latin America. So for new democracies only, it's valid. Mm -hmm. and, and then I had a, a, another question for, for Mariam. Uh, so from your presentation, I, I seem to have understood that, uh, well, you consider that there is no general strategy for mass media to deal with, with populist rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, but these years, it is true that we have seen uh, at least two main approaches. Uh, the first one is to confront, confront populist uh, lies, um, informing about uh, the propaganda and, and rebating you know, these, these ideas through techniques such as fact-checking, mm -hmm. or uh, alternatively to leave populist messages uh, such as manipulated data or pure lies out uh, of the spotlight. Um, in which situations would you say that the one is, is, is better than, than the other? What, what is your experience re regarding all this uh, as an opinion editor uh, in, in El País? Well, um, I, I think, uh, as I've said before, uh, this question goes beyond journalism. Uh, it is about democracy itself. Uh, um, we think that journalism must be objective, it must preserve, preserve democratic rules too. Um, we defend free speech, but we also defend democracy. And speaking about free speech doesn't all, does also imply to pronounce ourselves on its limits for the sake of democracy. And, and I see a very clear limit regarding that. We should then normalize populism or political positions that are very close to this ideology or sympathize with it, because the main instrument they have is the traditional platforms. Um, as I said, for me, that was very interesting to, to, to read this book written by Angela Nagel, where she explains how to, to the all right movement made it into the mainstream media and was able to occupy the centrality of political debate. So I, I think that is the, that is the point. Uh, they achieve it mainly because their scandalous position were considered informative on part of, of those media. That's a, a, a movement that came from the margins of internet was able to gain an hegemonic position in public uh, debate. So the media themselves gave them that opportunity and, and, and baking. But I think there is not a, a general rule on that. I would say that uh, it is important that journalism doesn't look at itself as, as, as if 
it were a kind of political party, as I said, and, and I think the most important thing regarding that is journalism must, must do journalism, which is looking for news, train its own agenda, uh, bring issues to the public sphere. So journalism is not the fourth power. Journalism is a source of power itself. It has this authority to draw the terms of public debate, but sometimes journalism chooses the easy way to inform on issues and in a way that can make them gain more traffic on the way, on the way for instance. So yes, it is, it is a, a dilemma, very, very difficult dilemma. Okay, uh, Javier, are there more questions from, from people? No, 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 not for the moment. I've seen some notes like um, someone who seems to be uh, Polish by the name. So in Poland, Euro enthusiasts predominate. In recent study, it is 70% of a population. So this, this backs, you know, the, what Tunis has, uh, has said before, you know, that we, we shouldn't think that Eastern Europe is Eurosceptic, hmm? except for, for some of the parties, of course. Yes, absolutely. Hmm. And then uh, um, here, Juan, Juan Perez Villalba, he frames his question in Spanish. I'll try to translate. So populists accuse the media, but on the other hand, uh, populists uh, um, get their life from the media in order, in order to create messages of confrontation so that so that the media are terribly useful, you know, for them. So it's not just that. So media are, um, seem to be their enemies, but on the other hand, they are in need of the media because it's through them that they can have such a voice, right? So I think this coincides with, with things that have been said. I'm just trying to, to put it into the overall conversation. So Javier, if we don't have more, um, more questions, then I think... Um, then I think we should, um, we should finish. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, of course, um, the two subjects were different, but somehow they were united by, by, the, um, by a common phenomenon, which is populism. And um, I think they fit very well within, within the, the overall, I mean, the, the broader subject of this, of this webinar. Thank you both for being with us, and of course, Thank you to all the to all the participants on the on the web.